Y'all, welcome back to Anti-War Radio, Chaos 92.7 FM in Austin, Texas. And I'm very happy to welcome back our regular guest, Dr. Gareth Porter. He's an independent historian and investigative journalist, writes for IPS News. You can find all his IPS articles at antiwar.com slash porter. Welcome back to the show. Hey, glad to be back on your show, Scott. Well, I'm glad to have you here. All right, so let me tell you this, Gareth. I think this ties in with uh, your new article here. Uh, I was just sharing with the good people, if I can uh, find the link, here it is. Uh, I was just sharing with the good people here this uh, quote from a man named Carol Quigley, who was a foreign policy studies professor at Georgetown University. He taught our uh, mutual friend John Utley, actually. Uh Anyway, and so here's, uh, here's something that he wrote in his book, Tragedy and Hope. The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinaire and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out. He's got his little ironic quotes there. At any election, without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy, either party in office becomes in time corrupt, tired, unenterprising, and vigorless. Then it should be possible to replace it every four years, if necessary, by the other party, which will be none of these things, but will still pursue with new vigor approximately the same policies. Now, I think probably most of the analysis of tragedy and hope over the years would say that he's referring simply to the old, uh, what they used to call the liberal eastern establishment, the WASP establishment that uh, runs America. But um, I believe in my discussions with you that you have... uh, at least a, a take that if this does apply, which it would seem to with the selection of Joe Biden for uh, Barack Obama's running mate and so forth, that perhaps it's, it's a, a different set of interests that both parties are now beholden to. I do indeed. And, and you know, this, uh, the story that I just published that you have on com today, I think is, is really a nice lead into that uh, whole theme that I'm so interested in, which is that the national security bureaucracy really does hold enormous power to frame the issues and then to carry out the programs and policies that really serve the self-interest of the national security bureaucrats and their bureaucratic organizations rather than the interest of the nation, of the American people. There's really no connection at all between the policies that they follow and uh, the interests of the American people in terms of uh, security in any objective sense. And I think the story about the the attempt by the Bush administration to extend NATO membership right up to the borders of Russia, particularly in the the most controversial, most violent area uh, of Russia's border, which is the secessionist territories between Russia and Georgia. This whole story, I think, illustrates perfectly the way in which bureaucratic self-interest predominates over any attempt to to serve the objective interests of the American people. Okay, now let me stop you there, because I'm a libertarian. I don't believe there's such a thing as the interests of the American people, because everybody's an individual. So it's pretty easy to see, I would say, I would argue that all along the the government, maybe there are a couple of occasions here or there or something, but all along, uh, everything that every politician does is to satisfy a certain interest at, at the expense of the rest of us. Whether we're talking about foreign policy or whether we're talking subsidies for farmers or whatever it is, it's stealing from some of us to give to somebody else. And so even before it was the neocons and their buddies at Lockheed and their buddies in the Air Force or whatever, it was the bankers and the oil men and, and those people who were getting over on the rest of us, never the national interest because, uh, well, basically it's a fiction, right? Well, I think that's, that's right. I mean, my only objection to the framework that you present there is, is simply that it suggests that there is nothing that could be done that would serve the interests of the rest of us, and I, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think, in other words, that there's a rational policy that would certainly make Americans more secure than the policies that are being followed by the 
uh, bureaucrats in their own self-interest. So that. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I don't mean to suggest that yeah. it's absolutely impossible. I think, of course, the vast majority of us, at least, would benefit from ending the empire, for example. Right. Exactly. But I guess I just mean to say that politicians are are just individuals too, and all through yeah. American history, they've been Morgan partners, and you know wherever they found these scumbags from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's no doubt that this fits into a larger pattern of uh, you know individual self-interest prevailing over the interests of those who put them into power. Right. Now the difference is you're saying that all these different you know groups of, of people with power throughout the years who have built up the American empire, that the state itself now is so big it's just a giant dirty snowball rolling downhill, and this think tank or that think tank can have some influence, but basically it's the Pentagon that's running this thing. Well, yes. I think the point is is not just that the national security bureaucracy is so big. It certainly is big, and it and it um, has amassed enormous power in terms of the amount of money that it disposes, and, and that's certainly a major part of its of its power. Uh, but further than that, I think they have managed to kind of monopolize legitimacy in a sense politically. Um, and that's really a big part of the problem that uh, at some point I hope we can address on your show, but I don't want to get diverted into that too much. Uh, but, but I think, you know, there are multiple sources of power that they've appropriated since the early Cold War. And, of course, it, it began even before that. I mean, it begins during World War II when the U.S. military, you know, changes dramatically uh, in terms of the amount of money and bureaucratic tools that they have available to them. Uh, but the Cold War really is is what uh, changed the nature of the national security bureaucracy forever in this country, and and that's uh, I think a big part of the story that still remains to be told in terms of the history of U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there's always been ever since Alexander Hamilton, there have been people in our government who were imperialists and wanted to conquer this, that, or the other thing. But after every major war in American history. We had demilitarized, and, you know, we had plenty of wars. Uh, ask the Mexicans, uh, ask the Indians. But when we were done, basically the factories went from weapons of war back to making productive things. And what was different about World War II was they didn't demilitarize. They just decided that the Soviet Union, which had just lost 50 million men, was about to take over the entire world if uh, we didn't stop them. And so they basically kept on that World War II footing, a war in preparation for war ever since, simply right. because those were the people who had the most influence over the Pentagon. And, and Truman at the time, right? So that's right. And, and, of course, what they then had to do was to begin to mold a public opinion in a much more systematic way to, as, as Harry Truman once said, to scare the hell out of the American people in, in order to be able to assure that the programs that they had in mind would be passed without any difficulty in Congress. So that really becomes part of the system as well. Okay, so we have this... Uh, you know, uh, Nick Terse wrote this book called The Complex. It's the military, industrial, congressional, scientific, <laughs> academic, entertainment. media, entertainment, <laughs> absolutely everything complex. Yeah. And but what you're what you're really trying to drive at here is that the military part, that first word in this complex, is what really goes in bold. That all those other people, even the Congress at this point, become the bit players in their movie. Well, I'm not suggesting they're bit players, but I do think definitely the military leadership, uh, the uniform military leadership, is at the center of this structure of power. They do, in fact, uh, mold the broad outlines of U.S. military policy from one year to the next, from one presidency to the next. And, you know, I think that that has had a much greater sort of uh, influence over the decisions about war and peace and about, you know, who's the enemy and, and who isn't than has generally been appreciated. And I would trace this again back to the early Cold War years. Uh, you, can, you can show, I think, in one instance after another that uh, military leadership has essentially pulled the debate in one direction uh, very heavily and uh, excluded certain options and put much more weight on other options by its influence on policy, military policy, and, and thus uh, foreign policy at large. Can you give us some examples from previous wars? Well, I mean, I would, first of all, to go back uh, to the very early Cold War period, uh, this does not involve a war that was actually fought, but it was certainly a war that the uh, military, and particularly the Navy, uh, had in mind. Uh, they, were, they were quite fond of the idea of going to war against China.
from very early in the Cold War, and it was the Navy that more than any other service was pushing for war against China. The, the Navy leadership from very early on coveted the idea of a naval base in China, and they had been promised that by Chiang Kai-shek, uh, their, their uh, World War II ally and uh, immediate post-war client. And when the Chinese communists uh, took power in China, and that option of getting the naval base from uh, the existing Chinese regime uh, disappeared, then the Navy said, well, we're not going to give that up. We're going to continue to press uh, against China. We're going to uh, push China and uh, provoke China in the hope that we can have regime change either through a war or otherwise. So that's just uh, you know one of the classic examples of how the military – uh, did, in fact, influence U.S. foreign policy because the U.S. policy did fall into line with that relatively early on and really never got out of that groove. And, and of course, that, that was a fateful a decision, a fateful policy decision that uh, really shaped uh, U.S. policy in East Asia from that time on and, and certainly uh, was a very strong contributor to the fact the United States went to war in Vietnam.